to, to God's Word today. We're continuing on in our series going through uh, Luke, and we've reached Luke chapter 6, and uh, um, how appropriate it's Jesus uh, praying uh, as to his accession, who follows him um, in the journey into the ch- life of the church. He's choosing the 12 apostles. So let's uh, hear God's word as it comes in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 onwards. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names, Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. So here, here is Jesus, and I, it's very tempting for preachers when they're going through uh, the Gospels or when they're going through any passage of Scripture and to say, I'm not sure what I can say about this because it's, uh, it's um, you know, it feels a little bit thin on the ground what, what can be said about this particular passage. And then when I actually got into it, it was, it was, uh, it's, it was rich in so many ways. Let's, uh, can we have the, the, the PowerPoint for the sermon up? Thanks. So I want to talk today about uh, prayer, formation, and identity, and what that looks like. I wonder if we could have the PowerPoint for the sermon. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, there we go. Okay. Just thought I'd show you this because this was beautiful today. It kind of gave me hope uh, in the midst of a bleak week. This was from China, and it was... It's actually when you, I think they say it's, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong with this, but I think they say when it's got when one cloud behind another and one is a dark cloud and one is a light cloud, you can get this phenomenon of what's known as iridescent pileus cloud. There we go. Beautiful thing. Just reminds me of the promises of God. So we're thinking about prayer, uh, formation, identity, our calling as Jesus' disciples. And I want us to think about this today. Um, a trajectory. Think of a trajectory. A trajectory is the idea of something where you you anticipate where something will be if it if it um, uh, if, if it keeps going in the in the direction it's going. The trajectory is that it's heading somewhere. There is more to this passage in front of us, and it's in a bigger context, if you like. Um, Kathy would, t- if she was doing her, her photography work, would talk about wide-angle lens and fisheye lens. Do they still talk about that? You know, wide-angle lens is the big picture versus the very focused picture. And we've seen some of that with the James Webb telescope, of course. You have this, the big picture that we all see is the big night sky, and then they focus in, and you, you realize they're only looking at a tiny portion of the sky, and there's hundreds of galaxies, if not thousands there. So wide-angle lens, more focused. And there's something of that, I think, in what I want to reflect on today. Why should you listen? Because what we're talking about here is learning about the call on all our lives to follow the model that Jesus set. So let's, let's talk about this. Firstly, uh, prayer. Life requires prioritization. Jesus prays and he says, who are to be the symbols of of my new people. It's this moment in time, if you notice at the beginning of the passage, uh, it says um, at that time, Jesus decided to go up the mountain to pray about who would be his his apostles. What's the moment that it's referring back to? Well, it's when the people, um, the religious types are starting to gang up on Jesus. And he says, that's the moment where I'm going to focus on who are the new Israel that are, are coming into being? This is what you would call an embodied action. It's a symbolic action. We're seeing a lot of those on our TV screens at the moment with the, the pomp and ceremony uh, from the UK. Symbolic actions. And we saw that, saw that at Parliament House yesterday as well as they uh, formally went uh, in front of the statue of, of the, the Queen to, to mourn her death. Embodied actions are really important. You think of Jesus going into Jerusalem, that's an embodied symbol. And Jesus is saying, who should I focus my deepest energies on? Because we can all only do so much. Jesus was one person. 
I think, though, as we read between the lines in this passage, that he, he gives them the title of apostles. That may be actually Luke putting that phrase on it from, from later. They became known to be apostles. Um, but here we are. We've got 12 disciples, 12 apostles. And, uh, and, and apostles becomes eventually a term that's kind of a title. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is a discipleship group within a wider discipleship group that's going on. He later says, who are my brothers and my sisters? And he said, who are my mothers? And he says, who, whoever does God's will. Those are disciples. So he talks about discipleship group like family elsewhere. And that was a, a fairly common view of the time. A rabbi would take some disciples and they would be like family to him. They would live, eat, sleep uh, together. They would be in each other's bus business. They would live in close proximity. They would be chosen by the rabbi and you can't choose your family, um, but, but that would be an image that would be in their minds and what a discipleship group is. And some of his choices aren't obvious. I don't know when you were getting picked at school for the school football team or the school cricket team or whatever, or you know the, the PE teacher right, would say, right, you and you picked, picked teams and you're, I don't know if you were particularly sporty or whether you were sort of waiting there and going, I'm gonna be the last chosen right? Um, and um, Jesus makes some interesting choices here for his first choice. None of his first choice really are, are the religious types in the passage. I mean, what have you got? You've got James and John. What was their nickname? Anyone know that? Sons of Thunder, right? It's almost like a rock band, okay? You can almost see the logo, Maybe they had camels with the, the, the logo on the side of their camels and racing stripes, right? I mean, what sort of guys get names like that, okay? And then there's Gobby Peter. And they've all got a bit of a story. Then there's Judas. Judas came with a bunch of skills. Maybe he was a good accountant. I don't know, but he has his weaknesses because he wants to fiddle the money, it says elsewhere in the Gospels. Did Jesus know that at this point when he chooses Judas? I don't think he did, necessarily. I think it says later, he says it begins, you sense that it's beginning to dawn on Jesus because Jesus was subject to the same limitations as you and I as a human being. He did not know everything. And maybe in the will of God, there's, there's, a, there's some things that are not 100% certain as to who will betray him at that point. I don't know. That's a debate for those of us who, who like to think about predestination and free will. But the primary aim of this narrative, though, is to highlight the new Israel. There is this sense of Jesus asking God, who do I focus on? And so here for Jesus, what does he say? My, my calling is to Israel, right? That's what he says all the way through. Um, this is a wide angle lens as it were. This is my calling. It's Israel. But that actually doesn't stop him from going beyond that which is the boundaries as it were. So he cares for a Canaanite woman. He cares for a Samaritan woman. He cares for a centurion servant, none of whom are part of the people, of, uh, part of the Jews, part of the people of God. Now, that sort of stuff would have stopped any other rabbi. So what you see with Jesus the rabbi is someone who has a sense of, I'm called to Israel, but I, I'm, I'm, I'll go wherever love takes me. Love is not bound by calling or convention. It extends beyond. So Israel is the big, the big wide angle for him, as it were, the kind of boundaries which are a bit porous. And then you've got the lost sheep. He says, I'm called to the lost sheep of Israel. The lost sheep are those who are Jewish but on the outer, as it were. They're the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the quote-unquote sinners. People who are children of Abraham. Now that is constantly interrupted by the Pharisees saying, why are you mixing with these people? But he makes time for the Pharisees too and for those who have such questions or accusations. Now, so you've got Israel, the lost sheep of Israel, and then on the inner, you've got his wider discipleship group. So he sends out 70, he sends out, um, and he has the women who, who are disciples as well. And most times, like any rabbi, this discipleship group, how big they were at various times, uh, I'm not sure we can really say, but they would travel with him, they would absorb the way he lived, his lifestyle, what he did. 
And then here in this passage, you've got the, the apostles, the twelve. But we know the, the term apostle begins to get expanded as the, the history of the church goes on. But it's not just the twelve that he's got around him, but a relatively small group, I suspect, that also included uh, women. Um, how do I know women were amongst the, the disciples? Well, there's all kinds of terms uh, that's used in the New Testament. But, but one of them, for example, is a story we get later in Luke, which is a story of Mary and Martha. And Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, which is a, a phrase for anyone who is a disciple of a rabbi. They're sitting at the feet of a rabbi. Now, having women in a, in a discipleship group at this time was unique for a rabbi. And of course, must have been uh, tricky to negotiate to, to not be accused of impropriety. I suspect a lot of the women were, were actually married. Um, but it's interesting, none of the Pharisees ever accused Jesus of that kind of impropriety. And so that suggests uh, that maybe, yes, most of them uh, were married, but certainly he, he included women in the group. So here he is, he makes this decision, I'm going to spend a night in prayer. Have you ever asked yourself this question? If Jesus needed to pray all night, and it was Jesus, I think you can hear where I'm going with this sentence, ouch, how much more do we need? Right? If he needed to do that, how much more do we need to focus on prayer? and focus on being with God. At the heart of maybe any major, major decision ought to be soaking prayer, as some people have used the term. I also like the term wrestling. That's the term for Israel. They were wrestlers with God. They tried to wrestle God um, into giving answers, providing solutions. Fighting your way through to a place of discernment. You've heard me say this, the shopping basket approach, right? You make a big shopping list, you know, and it's putting all your bags in one basket, right? Oh God. And you're just going, oh God, want this, want this. I think it's a lot more of an engaging kind of just being with, hanging out with, silence, sitting with God. Do you remember when some of you aren't old enough, but when mobile phones first came in and people had earpieces in and you could be walking down the road and somebody's just chuntering away um, to themselves and it was such a, maybe it was just me, it was such a shock to the system. You thought, I'm going to pass over on the other side here. There's a strange man talking to himself in front of me. And there's something of that kind of going on, always having an earpiece in for what the Lord is saying. So many ways to pray. Um, it's emotional. The Psalms are emotional. It's written prayers. It's journaling. It's drawing, if that's your thing. Um, it's writing a song uh, alone with God or, or perhaps with others. I, that used to be my thing a lot more than it is these days. Um, and if boredom, boredom is an issue, change it up. So prayer. Jesus chooses the disciples. This was uh, me playing Scrabble uh, a, a, a few months ago. And it seems really obvious what I should be putting up there, given what you know about a certain author that I, I like to read and mention. But I will not mention him this morning, because um, the answer isn't what that looks like, a certain English author. It, the answer is, uh, actually, you can put tent-like down there and get a seven letter word if you ever play Scrabble, which is what I did. So the answer was not obvious. These disciples were not the obvious choice and yet God speaks and it, this is the new Israel because God can take anybody and use them. Um, the other thing about this I want to reflect on is discipleship and formation. Uh, Sue and I have a uh, a discussion sometimes about this, which word is, is a better word to use. Discipleship has a sense of a, a relationship with a rabbi, a little bit of the word discipline in there as well, I suppose. Uh, formation says there's an intentionality 
to being in the faith, to, to walking with God. So let me just, let's just think about this for a moment. Firstly, grace. Every one of these guys has a history. None of them are the, in the in crowd. They do not come because they deserve God's gift. They come because they know that they need His grace. They've been wooed by Jesus. He's like a magnet uh, drawing them to, to Himself. Peter, when he's asked, as we read a few, uh, a few weeks ago, he thinks that his sin means that he can have nothing to do with Jesus, but Jesus says, come on, come, follow me, come with me. And that realization that we got, we got nothing is a key to spiritual growth. We have got nothing. That is where grace comes in. A- another, another word is this word, repentance. The word repentance is a word that sometimes kind of means uh, you're going one direction, you turn around, and you start going in another direction. Let me give you an example from the first century of this word, not in the Bible. Um, 30 years after uh, Jesus, there was a man called Josephus who became a Jewish, well, he was Jewish, but he became a historian, and uh, he wrote about the rebellion in Rome, uh, rebellion in, in Jerusalem in AD 70 and so on and wrote lots of uh, Jewish history from the first century. Josephus was very much involved in the political life of first century Israel. And there's a story where Josephus goes to a group of rebels who want to overthrow uh, the king of Israel, um, um, whoever was the king at the time, I can't remember. Um, And and he says to them, look, your way's not going to work. Your way sucks. You need to start going my way and and trust my plan, go with my plan. And the phrase that he uses when you read that is exactly the same phrase Jesus and John the Baptist use, repent and turn around, believe me. It's the exact phrase in, in, in the Greek there. And so it's the idea of stopping something and doing something different. And that's what the disciples have already responded to, but it's a choice that's ongoing. Every day that Peter's away from the family business of fishing, he's probably thinking, I wonder what's going on back home with the business. And we read elsewhere that some women supported the discipleship group, but even so, there's a cost here. Um, There is a cost. It's it's ongoing and not just a one-off thing. And it's a very um, practical thing. It's not about I'm going to be, feel a little bit more spiritual, have an inward enlightenment. It says there are things that we will do, um, maybe month by month, something slightly different, that we're going, okay, Lord, what does it look like to follow you here? What does it look like to follow you now? Sue's been, Sue's been uh, doing uh, shopping online recently for, for things that are more eco-friendly so we don't keep pouring plastics into the ocean. And so we've got all these um, strange and wondrous shampoos and, and, and things that you put in your washing machine so it, the, the clothes don't leak pl- plastics out. And that's kind of a, 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 just an illustration of, so, of a, an ongoing repentance, as it were. It might be something different for you, but it's saying there are specific and grounded and practical things that we ought to be doing as the Lord uh, speaks to us, and as we uh, are identified, uh, we are able to identify, because they're quite different for different people at times. Now, formation is, is a whole uh, life thing. It's about every nook and cranny. When you become a Christian, some people like to say, well, Jesus comes into your heart. Not very good theology, I have to say. It's more like we enter into the life of Jesus. We no longer live. And when it says, you know that phrase, you no longer live, but Christ lives in you? That phrase in the Bible is actually in the plural. So it's not so much about Jesus in my heart, and it's, I'm still alive, and, but he's a little part of me. It's actually more often we go get placed into Christ. I no longer live. I get crucified. It's not my will. And so God, when we become a Christian, says to us, of, of every part of our life, that's mine, and that's mine, and that's mine, that bit too. Yeah, and that bit too. And being a Christian is working out what that looks like as we go along. 
Think of the great commandment. Think of it this way. What's the, the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with heart, soul. What else there? Strength. I miss anything? Mind. All of those things. So all of those things, you take them each one at a time. Heart, that's your emotions, your will, your volition, your mind. That's thinking that you need to be thinking about uh, Scripture and, and, and Jesus and, and uh, things like that. Strength, that's bo- embodied actions. That's, that's doing drawers, that's doing kids' hope and so on. Soul, suche in, in the Greek, uh, nefesh in the Hebrew, it's a kind of term that means kind of everything. So it's a cover-all catch, catch-all at the end. Everything else. And you could go round that quadrant, as it were, of heart and mind and strength and soul and keep doing that in your life until the day you die. You're going, okay, I've been working out my strength. I've been serving. I've been doing these very practical things. But how's your emotions? How's your heart love for Jesus? How's your, your thinking about Scripture? How's the regular habits that enable us to do go around that quadrant as it were what might it be for you it's jesus centered i was reading i don't know if you're familiar with the alpha course i was reading some criticisms of the alpha course through the years and one of them said it was too focused on jesus and i'm going say what wasn't Trinitarian enough or something, I think they were saying, and we're just going, yeah, pull, pull your head in. <laughs> um, Mark 4, when it talks about the calling of the disciples, says he called them to be with him in order that they might share in his ministry. I love that phrase, be with, in order to. You need both of those happening. You need to be with and not live in order, in the ministry stuff, in the work stuff, in the, the striving stuff. We need both of those to be going on. So we work on ourselves, we work on our spiritual life, and we also serve others and love others, and, and there's an interaction there. And being with is a gift. Look at this uh, quote from a therapist. Um, I've spent the last 40 years undoing damaging views of God. I'm a therapist and many clients come in saying, God is in control, as if it's an incantation that magically makes life understandable. Doesn't work. We therapists try to replace that with thinking that says, God is alongside us, not above dictating events to teach us a lesson or drive us to him. God's withness bypasses control and highlights relationship rather than position. Now, that would take a lot of unpacking to un- unpack that. I just, I just was really struck by that, that sense of God alongside us. And sometimes if we don't have a right perspective on, on how God is with us, it can affect our mental health. It can affect our psychological well-being if we don't have a clear and uh, biblical view of what it looks like to be with and for God to be with us. So, uh, knowing God is with us is, in the story we live, means that our story is also part of His. There's a, this idea again of the, our little story becomes part of, gets placed into Christ, and it becomes part of God's big story. And that's reassuring because we don't know how our lives will end. Will it be with a bang, with a whimper? How will, we don't know that. But we're placed into God's story, and we know how that story ends, right? I think the phrase happily ever after could be used. The lion sitting on the throne, with uh, the lion and the lamb, the, the new Jerusalem coming down to earth. That's our story that we get, our little story, placed into And that's discipleship. That's the journey in Christ. And it's a journey that we do with God, not just for God. Okay, let's uh, uh, finish with this. I say finish, but 
you know, what's the, what's the line? Some, some, some preachers say finally and finish, and others say lastly and last. Might be that one. Okay. Uh, think about this word apostle. Apostle uh, kind of in the, in the verbal form means, means sent, to send. Um, and obviously, in the noun, it's somebody who is sent. A disciple means a pupil of a rabbi. Now, Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations, sent, as it were, to the nations, or in their case, drawing the nations to God. The 12 tribes, in all their diversity, were to model unity and godliness and the glory of God. It wasn't a solo thing. It's, a, it's 12 here. Um, and it's obviously their parallel to the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a symbolic group. They didn't get all their stories written up in the, in the Bible as heroes of the faith, though strong tradition does have um, some stories to say of how Peter died or how Thomas headed out to, towards India and so on and so forth. But as far as Jesus is concerned here, the main issue is a symbolic one. This is the new Israel. There's diversity, there's unity. They've all got uh, different stories. And it's the men who are mentioned here. But clearly Jesus had in, included women too in his wider group, as I said earlier. So let's think about this, this term, apostle. There's a thing in which uh, Mrs. Smith will be able to come back at Christmas maybe and tell us all about a thing called semantic range, which is the idea in language of, of words have, have um, a range of meaning depending on the context, depending where you are. So uh, my mother and father went to an Anglican church in Scotland at, during which they would share the peace, right? <laughs> Maybe this isn't a good illustration. Don't make up illustrations on the spot, Julian. Um, they would share the peace, which is greet one another with a, a kiss of peace or a, a, a high five or a handshake or whatever and say hello to one another. Except the problem was in Scotland, of course, the word peace means sandwich, but none of you knew that, did you? And so you would visit that church and go, oh, good, we get to eat now, you know? We're going to share the peace together. Um, but words, words, words that are spelt the same can, can have a range of meaning. So apostle can mean sent out one, and that's one that's widely range, uh, used in the New Testament. Apostle used of this specific group of, of 12 has a sense of the new Israel, supplanting the old Israel. And this new people uh, vibe, as it were, carries on into the book of of, of, of Acts. This group are still a significant group, but, but they're, they're a, sp a specific group. Almost all of them are, are actually martyred. And so apostleship also becomes associated with suffering with Jesus, which Paul picks up on in his own apostleship in 2 Corinthians. But in this passage, Luke wants to present a continuity between Jesus' ministry, the disciples' ministry, and the early church. They're being sent out as the new Israel, sent out apostles. So what do I mean by the new Israel? God's representatives, redeemed images of God, reflecting God's glory into the world. They start with the old Israel. Acts takes us further into the Roman Empire and all the, all the disciples in the verbal form are apostolized. Whether you're a woman, a man, whoever, the, you're all sent ones in that sense. Sense. But apostle, uh, the noun, has a, has a specific meaning that tends to get used in the New Testament, which is, becomes almost like one who has seen the risen Lord and sent to tell others about this. Sent to tell others about this. Apostles. Who, who were the first ones to see the risen Lord? The women. And it literally says, go tell my disciples. Who were the first people to preach to the disciples of the good news of the risen Lord? The women. This was at a time when you wouldn't invent a story where women were the main witnesses. You just didn't do this in the first century. They weren't allowed to speak in court or had their opinion validated. They were, 
gossips, there were, they were, there was all kinds of cultural cliches about the nature of women. And yet, why would the early church put the resurrection narrative and the women front and center of that if they were inventing it? They wouldn't. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, there they are, front and very firmly in, in the center. I love the story of the women there, and it's almost like you can almost see them sit talking to one another on the way, the way to tell the disciples, let me tell them, no, no, let me, let me. Last week, um, my, my son and his girlfriend came over for my birthday anniversary, Father's Day um, joint celebration, and um, they gave me a card and on it, it said, um, love from Luke and Jackie. And then in microscopic um, writing underneath, she put, your future daughter-in-law. I didn't notice. <laughs> I was abused all day by my family for not having noticed that, you know. And eventually they told us. It was their way of saying, we've got good news. Okay. So here are these women. They, are the, they have the privilege of being the first who are sent ones. Okay, I'm going to skip on a little bit here. I could talk a lot more about uh, women and their role. Let me give you just one more example um, in, in this. Phoebe, two more examples. Phoebe gets sent with the letter to the Romans, to the church in Rome. He is, she is, he, she is sent as a, a, a not just a postwoman, because in those days, if you had the letter, if you were carrying a letter, you knew what was in the letter, and you were, it would be there to enable the sense of what was in the letter to be communicated. So Phoebe, it's very, very possible, because it would happen a lot, is that Phoebe was the first person to read out loud the letter to the Romans. I wonder if she got as confused as we do when, when she read it, you know? So she was the first one to preach through Romans to the church, or at least read it out. And when the, the church were going, well, what, is, what did Paul mean by that? She would go, well, I think he meant this. What do you call that preaching? I don't know. But it is interesting, at the end of Romans, there's, there's a, a character there called Junior, J-U-N-I-A, um, who it says is of note amongst the apostles. Scholars are almost entirely united on this. Firstly, this is a woman, and secondly, this is a woman apostle. So, I know this, not everybody will agree with me on this. That's life, that's, that's uh, preaching. But I would, would want to say this. When the Spirit comes and, and He comes upon each person, regardless of race, creed, gender, uh, barbarian, Greek, slave, whatever. He brings with him whatever gifts he chooses uh, to bring. And for some reason, Jesus um, again and again validates the ministry, the work, the life, the calling of women. Because I think he views them as fellow image bearers of the living God. Now, you can argue the toss over how you practically work some of that out in the first century context, but I think the context is really important. And even when we read some of the more difficult passages in the New Testament, which I'm happy to talk to you about at some point, um, about uh, women and teaching and things like that, um, we have to read it in this wider context of this very brutal, misogynistic, patriarchal culture that even despite all that, there was a recognition of the calling and gifts of, of women. So what have we said uh, in this? Let me skip on a little bit here. Actually, in many terms, this is another comment on the verbal form of apostolane. That's what we've done to Missy. That, that kind of form is used, you know, a sent out one, um, in, in with a small a for apostle. So, what have we talked about? We've talked about prayer, we've talked about grace, we've talked about repentance, being with Jesus, 
being sent one, uh, the central role of women in the New Testament, that diverse, united communities embracing all. Let's pray together. Maybe you just want to take uh, one of that list that I just ra- rapidly went through and just say, okay, what do I reflect on here? What do I find difficult? What do I find challenging? What do I think I disagree with on or need to think about further? What do I need to embody this week and do this week? Lord, thank you for the, the model of Jesus and his calling of the 12 and of the wider dis- discipleship group. Thank you for your amazing love for us in calling us to be your disciples, to walk with you each day and to live each day in step with you and your spirit and to, uh, to witness to the life of Christ wherever we go. Lord, we pray that you would teach us what that looks like for us individually. There can be so many different ways that we uh, keep trying to walk with you. Help us not to be overwhelmed by the 101 things that we perhaps could or, or should do, but simply to focus on you and to find that thing which is our priority. So, Lord, as we go into uh, the coming week, we pray that we would indeed uh, stay in step with Jesus, the servant of all, even in this day as we uh, celebrate this, this great servant queen that we've had who has modeled to us so many good things of the life of Christ. We pray that we would also uh, walk in the Savior's footsteps this week. Amen. Let's close in worship together.